learn to improve conversions and generate more leads with the video podcast at marketingoptimization.tv. Hi, and welcome to Marketing Optimization with Docs Science. I'm your host, Alex Harris, and today we're chatting with Kara Harshman from Optimizely. How are you doing, Kara? I'm great. How are you doing over there, Alex? Doing well. Awesome. Uh, to get started, what would be your definition of optimization, and why is it beneficial? Optimization is the method of experimentation in order to understand your website visitors or any users, whether it's your mobile app or a mobile website, anyone interacting with your brand. Optimization is the method of experimenting in order to understand what's most effective in marketing to them. Mm. Well, you, you're definitely the, the ideal perfect interview for this show because you know everything we do on here we we experiment we try different marketing me as a web designer I'm, I'm using design and art to uh, get better results yeah and I think the audience is is kind of right there with me they're they're marketers who who work for their company and maybe they've reached a point where they're not getting you know the impact from the tests that they're really running or for instance like I was just on a call with someone on clarity and they had they set up their e-commerce site and they're like, we have Optimizely set up, we just don't have any idea what to do next. Mm -hmm. But so for, for just for the basics to really get started, what really is split testing? Sure. So split testing is just this very basic, very old idea of showing two different groups of people slightly different um, variations of the same thing. So whether it's a mail, mail at home ad or a web page or an email, it's showing two different experiences and then uh, measuring which one is more effective mm -hmm. based on whatever it is your whatever your goal is. So mm -hmm. whether it's um, like form fill outs or clicks or time on site or if it's sending a letter back to that mail at home ad you get. It's using those two different methods to see which one is uh, more effective. Yeah. 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 Th that really that experimentation that, and that ability to, to iterate it helps you actually save money because you don't spend too much money on that direct mail piece or that, that website design for experimenting and really putting it out there. Uh, yeah. And I think that's why Optimizely is such a uh, great software because it's so easy really to implement, but it can be hard to really figure out the right things to actually test. And we're going to go into detail, but maybe people don't know uh, about Optimizely, so maybe you can give it like your story of how you guys got started. Sure. So Optimizely started in 2010. Um, after, it was a Y Combinator company mm -hmm. that our co-founders, Dan Soroker and Pete Kuman went through a class of Y Combinator and had this idea based on Dan's experience working at the Obama campaign in 2008. Nice. So Dan was working at this campaign and he was trying to come up with ideas of how he could really add impact to the campaign as this data science computer engineer guy. So he decided to run a multivariate test, so changing two different elements on the on one page and seeing how the interaction effect impacted conversions. And in this case, conversions was donations to Obama's campaign. Mm -hmm. So he basically had a really hard time setting up that test. And when he was in Y Combinator, he thought, I want to make a product that would make A-B testing and multivariate testing easy for anybody. And out of that came Optimizely. It started as this visual editor for basically at changing variations and changing elements on your website. Mm -hmm. um, that was four years ago when it was like four people at this tiny little office. And now we're almost 300 people with two offices and a lot of people on the team. I joined in 2012 as the second person on the marketing team. And it's just been a crazy growth experience. I'm here in our San Francisco office. It's just kind of weird to look back and see how many desks there are. Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting because I remember it. I was working at a, a corporate job.com and we had built our own A-B testing platform. And we were testing actually moving to a third party for many years. We used old companies. I don't even know if they're around, you know, early Omniture, uh, an Optimost really early companies out there and I remember one of my developers just coming to me and showing me one day oh check out this one site you just go there you put your URL in and it automatically starts showing you how you can change the variations in the browser so I think you guys were definitely one of the first companies to do that uh, that type of onboarding process get the people to use it get, try it out and then move over to the actual plans yeah that was really our early competitive advantage is mm -hmm. having 
the just tested out URL on our homepage. People mm-hmm. could put in any web page and then just basically make it editable. It was an amazing experience. And since then, a lot of people have copied us. Yeah. So yeah. that visual editor is no longer the only competitive advantage. Um, but since then, I think our, our biggest strength is our customer base. We have about 8,000 customers all over the world, ranging from huge um, Alexa top 500 sites all the way to a really small business, small, medium business. So mm-hmm. there's no limit to um, what people are doing with Optimizely. It's just all over the map. Yeah, well, let, let's jump into some of the things that maybe uh, some of your, your customers are doing. Probably the more, more small business, either uh, that actually make, maybe making money online or, or generating leads. What would be, um, you know, some some of those top tips to you know really, uh, you know, get set up on Optimizely right first of all, and then get the biggest impact from those tests. Yeah. So that's a very big question, and it really depends, I think, on um, the, what. Where, where your test ideas are coming from. So you could be this small business and you're like, oh, the IT department and is just so removed. We have no idea how to make changes on our website. So if someone gets their hands on Optimizely, they're just going to want to go and change a ton of stuff to make it what they've always wanted it to be. So while that is a great idea, I don't recommend just going and testing willy-nilly, just testing what, at random, because then you won't really be able to seek that global maximum, the best possible version of what your website could be. If you're just running small tests here and there, you're going to get to the what we call the local maximum, not that top, top mountain peak where you can see over the rest of the world and see, see where you are in relation. Um, so I, I think the first thing to do is to look at your website analytics and to understand how visitors are flowing through your site and where drop-off points are. So I just did this with our blog. I'm starting to A-B test Optimizely's blog. And the first thing we looked at was, was pages with high bounce rate. So there's if, if you see indicators that a page is not engaging or people are leaving quickly or people are not visiting that page, if something really matters, if that page really matters to you, then you know that that's kind of a ding, 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 like a, a warning sign that you should be testing it. So get the quantitative data you need to understand um, how your website is performing, and then you can model your and hypothesize tests around there. So that is one way to do it. Another way is to just do qualitatively, do user testing. Ask people who are your target customers. Um, sit with them and walk them through your website. If, walk them through your main task. Every site needs to have a goal. I mean, if you ask someone, like, why does your website exist? What would you do if we took it down? That right there is the purpose of your website. And everything that you have should, all your information, all your pages should be set up so people can achieve that goal. You want to make it as easy as possible for your website, for your users to do it. So that is a great way to start as well, is to understand your goal and then track back from there the different points or the different pages, buttons, whatever it is that that leads you to achieve it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's gonna be it's gonna be different for for different sites, but uh, as you mentioned, you could really break it down to where to start testing. That would be your top traffic pages. In the case of a blog, it would be you know the top pages that are not your blog homepage. What are those? One or two are the pages that maybe have gone viral that you forgot about that are just sitting there. That would be a great place to start testing. Maybe the opt-in box. Maybe the, the value proposition. The, the headlines, uh, and then. You know, watching uh, people actually go through the sites using something like usertesting.com and watching people actually go through the site, see what they actually click on, make them actually check out, and you, people will tell you how to make their sites better. And then also watch people go through your competitor sites. It's, it's, it's a great idea to, you know, see, you know, how you kind of fit, uh, what your unique dif- differentiators uh, that make people actually uh, convert versus your actually competition. Um, I would also recommend on-page surveys. Oh, Yeah. You don't want to overload yourself with information. I you don't want to do. I wouldn't recommend people go out and be like, "All right, I'm going to need to look at my analytics. I'm going to need to do user testing on my site and competitor site and quality surveys." I think that's too much information. You'll just get buried under a pile of it. And you won't know what to do. Yeah. So if you're just starting out, just start sort of small. You don't have to do a huge, huge test. You just want to do, do something to get some quick win, some quick um, indication. It could be 
and a win doesn't mean a, a winning variation. A win means some insight into how your website experience is affecting your users and your visitors. So like even a fail variation is a really great thing to, to generate early. Yeah, absolutely. Because if, if you think something is going to win, you want to make sure you, that you test it. And if it doesn't win, uh, try to figure out why, because you can learn a lot from, from that for sure. And I, it was actually interesting because I was actually just talking to someone else about this. You know, you, you're looking through this qualitative data, you know, surveys, user tests, and then you're looking through, you know, analytics. And to come up with a good hypothesis, it takes a little bit of time. You might not get it right on your first, second, or third shot. Uh, but eventually, you're going to start to see patterns of what works on your site and what doesn't. And once you start to reach, reach that, that global maxima, as you, as you mentioned, you'll start to know exactly what your customers should do. And if you start to see the patterns that, are, that go wrong, there's something wrong with your site. Maybe you know, there's a problem with code or a particular area. So you should be able to anticipate all the opportunity down that customer journey from ad to landing page or wherever they're going all the way to, down to actually checkout. Yeah. And one important piece of this is segmenting your data. And we're talking about your customers or your visitors. Well, it's kind of a misnomer to just a bucket all of them or think about all of them in the same way because everyone is coming to your site from a different source, from a, with a different um, disposition. So if you run a test for 100% of your traffic and you have two variations, A and B, um, and you look at the look at it at the end, and you say, "All right, it was null. There is no difference between A and B." But then, if you parse that data, parse the results by um, location or by browser type or by device, you might find some really interesting nuggets of information. Like, okay, B worked extremely well for mobile visitors, but tanked for um, desktop visitors. Then that is a source for your next A/B test. So just because it didn't work for your entire visitor base, does not that's not a valid conclusion. You have to look deeper into that data. Yeah, I think that that is, is absolutely a, a very important fact because people, you know, visit uh, your site from different ads on different devices at different times of day in different places. So maybe, you know, working with your pay-per-click company to ensure that your mobile ads go to a mobile only experience versus a responsive experience that's a, you know a good test to run responsive versus mobile only you can even send your pay, your facebook ads mobile only to mobile only landing pages so you're segmenting by device by overall experience by geolocation by gender by demographic uh, it's, it's really endless depending on what's right for your uh, target audience because that's yeah. how actually you get qualified leads in the lead generation space. Right. And one more I would add to that is um, visitor type. Is it a returning visitor or a oh, new visitor? Absolutely. Or is it a customer and are they a return customer? If, they're, if you're an e-commerce site, do they have something in cart? Those are really interesting personas that you could start developing and saving and, and optimizely something called audiences. So you could you could create tests and always have your your one audience that you're you're comparing results against another audience like um, high value shoppers or or discount shoppers. How are those people different? Yeah, one of the main KPIs that we try to measure in e-commerce is time to purchase or average order value. But in this case, time to purchase you might want to segment out new visitors versus returning visitors. New visitors have that popover overlay, 10% off your first off, uh, f first order. That way they use a coupon right away and they actually purchase. Versus yeah. the, the returning visitor, you might want to personalize it. Uh, welcome back, Alex. Uh, here's your returning cart. Do you want to jump over and just complete, complete, complete checkout? So, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and one thing that you said that earlier is you asked me about the benefits of optimization, and we didn't really talk about that, but I think one of the biggest ones is just stopping arguments. Um, people are like, oh, it might work, oh, it might work, and then you spend 20 minutes or more sitting around a table de um, deliberating on what might work, but no mm -hmm. one actually knows. So there's no, there's no better decider than your customers or than your visitors to tell you what works best for them. That's why I think A-B testing and optimization is just such a no-brainer for anyone in any, op in any web business. 
right? Really? Yeah, I, I was I worked in a corporate job and I worked for a public company. And in public companies, they tend to have a you know the high VPs have a, a little bit of turnover. So I ended up working for you know 10, 15 different people. And every time someone new would come in, I'd have to teach them about why you should test. Oh no, this this is this is a nicer brand. We just paid this agency a whole bunch of money to redo this. Okay, well let me take you through the process of determining if it really works or not. So that became my my job was to be, you know, the data driven marketer. Everything was based on if you want if you, you can surely change the homepage if you want to, if you can beat it. Yeah. Hmm. If you can beat it, right. I'm really glad that you're doing a podcast like this because if we think about the evolution of something like search engine marketing or website analytics, um, it was when it was just coming out, it, people were like, well, why would I need that? Why do I need to know how long someone is on my web page for? Well, now it's industry standard. You can't call yourself a serious business if you're not, if you don't have Google Analytics or some analytics product. And same with PPC and search engine marketing. I think optimization and A-B testing are just as important and they're becoming a must have in the marketing stack for all business. Yeah, and I, I think people are starting to realize that it doesn't matter how much traffic that you send to your site, you can do all the content marketing in the world, it can't convert that traffic into sales. You're eventually going to run out of money. It's probably better to work with your core traffic that you have, optimize your existing traffic for a bigger ROI, and then spend money on what actually works. Once you know the campaigns are actually working, what headlines are working, you can use those headlines from your tests back into your remarketing campaigns, and that's really how you scale. You scale based on what wins. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. You scale based on what wins, and you repurpose based on what wins. There's a lot of case studies that we have um, from Optimizely of people finding out that okay, they, they tested on a small percentage of their traffic or of their on their product pages, for example. And then they once they found out that that was winning, they rolled it out to the rest. So that's another way to get your boss on board with optimization is say, we only have to test a small percentage of traffic just to, just to make sure it's okay. And then once you find out it's winning above and beyond or failing, then you don't go do it. Or if it is winning, you go do it. Yeah, yeah it's just... Go ahead and try to fail. Fail quickly. Eventually, you're going to figure out what's actually going to win, and you're able to, you know, scale those wins over time. Uh, absolutely, some, some great advice. It, it it sounds actually very simple, but it's actually very hard to do. If you do the, the quantitative research properly and the qualitative research uh, properly, you're going to be able to develop a really good hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And if it's done properly, you should be able to beat that hypothesis. Right. You know, uh, eventually, you're going to get a law of diminishing returns. It's going to be harder to beat. But that's when the real challenge starts to come. Uh, but in those that yeah. early quick winch process, you should be able to get some big lifts off of small changes. Right. And that's when it's kind of the like big overhauls. Once you've kind of maxed out on your small changes and you can't tweak anything anymore, you're not really seeing those results, then maybe it's time to just rethink the entire onboarding flow or the checkout process um, or whatever big goal that whatever big barrier to conversion that you have on your site. Yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, Chris Goward actually speaks to, about that from, from Wider Funnel, uh, you mm -hmm. know, about the evolutionary uh, website design. You know, people are going to start moving away from these big impact uh, website designs and they're going to move more to the Amazon model. I mean, it's a model that, you know, probably we have followed for a long time, but most people are realizing that Amazon never does a redesign. They iterate really quickly, and you never see those changes. And then all of a sudden, they're you know they're increasing their conversions, or they're doing more, and uh, you know that's really the model you should follow. Iterate as much as you possibly can until you're tapped out with all tests. Because really, the the secret to you know really good conversion is interrupting your current traffic patterns and using those to leverage bigger returns. Hmm. Interrupting your current traffic patterns. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so you have all of these, this traffic coming into your top traffic landing pages. That tells yep. you specifically where, where to test. But now you have to figure out specifically what to test. So you use heat maps specifically on those pages to figure out what people are clicking on. So now you know exactly what to test. So you're interrupting the pattern of what people are going to, and you um, maybe put something there that's more profitable for you. Right, I see, I see. Yeah, so yeah. they... You they arrive at like a category page, an e-commerce category page, and they're selling watches or jewelry. And you see that the, the page lists some of the, the best sellers at the top. But the best sellers happen to be like $299 or $2,000. Just take a low-cost item and move it to the very, very top. 
and you'll get people to buy lower cost items in a shorter amount of time with the same exact traffic. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Right. There's so many little hacks that you can do, especially heat maps. They're so, so insightful. You can see exactly where people are spending the most time, where they're scrolling to, if they're making it through the page. If you have some really important call to action way at the bottom of the page and you see people are just, it's cold. People are not moving there. Then move it up. Really interesting. Yeah, and this all comes down to, you know, you can, you can call it, um, you know, you can call it science. Uh, you can call it, you know, persuasion. But, but really, it's art, it's usability, it's you know, information architecture, the hierarchy of the page, how the page flows, uh, you know, how far you scroll down, if there's images at your active fold line so you know that there's stuff below. And all this comes down to, to really usability. Yeah, it really does. And re being able to force yourself to think creatively, usability and just understanding that you're going to need to stretch yourself a little bit because what's working might not be or what the right answer might not ever have been tried before and especially not by your company especially if you guys are more um i don't know slow moving and when it comes to adopting new web practices so yeah push your creativity and data those are the things that i think are most powerful for what what optimization enables for individuals just be letting their ideas come to life and being able to validate really crazy ideas people might have. Oh, it's, uh, it's really addictive once you start yeah. winning and, and you think you're on top of the world, but you get you get pushed right back to, to level when something starts losing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. I, I wish I could have a camera on the screen or on your computer that captures the moment you look at your optimizely results. Oh, yeah. That would yeah. be a hilarious just stream of footage. Oh, I'm like screenshot right at that moment. Uh, send to yeah. client. <laughs> yeah, right? I, I would think we should do that. Next Hack Week project. Yeah, us. that would be like testimonial. 30.30% yeah. uh, 30 increase. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, your your uh, epic moment of conversion improvements. Uh, so, well, uh, let's talk a little bit about you. So you run the Optimizing Blog. Yes. And so tell us what's going on there. You guys have exploded with content this year. Yeah. Um, thank you. That's great to hear. So I've been at Optimizely since for a little over two years. Um, I was the second person on the marketing team. And for a while, I got pulled off of all marketing day to day to ghostwrite a book. So I wrote this book called A-B Testing, The Most Powerful Way to Turn Clicks into Customers for Dan Soroker and Pete Kuman, our co-founders. You can find it at Amazon near you. So I um, learned a lot about optimization and A-B testing and really got to know the stories of, about people who test and the impact that it's made on their day-to-day -day lives. So that's kind of what propelled me to want to write all a lot more about conversion optimization and, and A-B testing. And we talked earlier about this, the naming scheme. Do we say A-B testing or conversion optimization? But it's all just using data to make decisions basically um so yeah the, the blog is in a pretty good space we are actively seeking guest posts we're actively seeking stories i'm trying to make it a place for people to come and learn actionable narratives about optimization people who are doing it at their jobs um big impacts that it's had in your the way your company culture operates and just sussing out those stories and bringing them to life because there's so many great things that happen every day but i think they don't they go untold too often oh yeah, yeah. Well, we, we live in a world behind our computers and uh setting up designing html and and it can be a lot of thankless jobs even though yeah. we're, we're helping our, our our companies or our clients make more money and it's satisfactory to us but you know it, it you, you a lot of times you, you hear more about something that happens wrong than all the good stuff. So yeah, it can be uh, somewhat of a thankless job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And writing the book was really fascinating because I got to talk to people at Netflix and at Dig, especially when Dig went through their major redesign and they yeah. didn't really A-B test the user experience. And they had a huge drop off in visitors and, and active users because of that. So that was not the only thing. It wasn't because they didn't test it, but there was other things with their back end not being scalable and not not, um, not ha holding the capacity of how many visitors they were getting. But anyway, it's like those times when data would have really solved it or testing would have solved a situation or when the vocal minority rises up against something that Netflix does. Uh, but the data says that it's right. So 
it's just these like conflicts of of human interest versus data and i want our blog to tell those stories very very cool well yeah. uh, let's let's tell the audience how they can uh, find out more about you and, and and the blog in general yeah, well, my name's Kara Harshman, as Alex said, and um, our blog is just blog.optimizely.com. I encourage you to read it and subscribe to our updates. Um, and then another really awesome place to find optimization information is our community. It's called Optiverse, and it's a place for all experimenters, anyone who cares about data and using experimentation to improve their business, to go and talk with each other. Um, ask each other questions, comment, and participate in our contests. And we do a lot of cool content out of those contests. We just published this awesome ebook um, called the Optimization Survival Guide, which was all curated from the Optiverse of people giving tips on optimization. What is one thing you wish you knew when you started optimizing? So look for that on there as well. Yeah, and become active because this is hard. Like you said, it's it, testing. It, optimizing is easy. Testing is hard. So you got to just understand like, that this is not just going to be a run a few tests, increase conversion rate 300% kind of thing. Sometimes you might get really lucky and you might have a really killer hypothesis that generates those results, but it's a labor of love. It's a constant iteration, constant understanding that you can do better, um, that this is, not, this is not the end all be all. Oops, the lights just went out in here. <laughs> cool. Well, 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 let's close off from there. Uh, what would be one thing that optimizers can do to to really take their conversion rates, uh, you know, get through that plateau and get to the next level? Sure. Well, this is a tough one, and I think really the only the best answer I can come up with is be fearless. Try things that you might not be comfortable with, that your boss might not give you full approval on, but it's just a test. When, whenever you come up against that question of, well, I'm not really sure if this is the right thing, and just say, well, it's an experiment. We're, like, it, it's not permanent. It's just a temporary thing that we're testing out on the site. Mm -hmm. So don't be afraid to just go where no one's gone before. Someone's probably gone there, so don't even worry about that. Um, be fearless and, and test new things. Yeah, and you're probably going to set up your first couple tests if you're just getting started, and 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 it may be winning uh, a lot at the beginning, and then it might lose. So that that first couple of days, the first couple of week that it's actually running, maybe just don't even barely look at it. Just make sure everything's working right, and then kind of maybe go take a break, go out to lunch a couple of days, or or take a vacation because yeah. uh, those first couple of days it's going to be all over the place. That's very true. That's I don't even think that's a suggestion. I mm -hmm. think that's a really important part of testing and in order to make sure it's a, a truly controlled, statistically sound experiment is to not look at your results before you know you've reached a certain threshold of traffic mm -hmm. that you need to reach minimal statistical significance. Mm -hmm. um, because if you do, you might make a rash reaction. Like you said, things fluctuate. Like time of day, day of week, all have really big impacts in how many visitors are coming to your website. Mm -hmm. So don't look at your experiment results until you have said, okay, it's hit this amount of traffic, I can look at it. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And and if you're not testing at all, at least try a couple experiments right now because I do not recommend testing during the holiday season. So if you are setting up tests, because this is probably going out uh, mm -hmm. the week of Halloween, probably uh, the, the, the couple weeks in between Halloween and Black Friday are really the only times to really start testing. Because once Black Friday comes along, everything should be in place and your site should be working 100% properly and you don't want to touch it. Okay. I don't know if I agree with that. Yeah? Yeah. Well, because that's one big thing that people have said is code freeze. Like all most e-commerce sites go into this code freeze, and right. what we're trying to say is, well, if you because you have such high traffic during these periods, and it granted it is a unique type of traffic, but it's it's the traffic that's coming nonetheless. Yeah. So if you can get any slight conversion increase, you could really blow your sales numbers out of the water for Q4 2014 or the end of the year. Um, I think it's a really amazing opportunity to capitalize on that huge traffic influx and mm -hmm. not be stagnant, especially if you haven't tested before. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point and absolutely a valid one. And if you actually are optimizing during the holiday season, especially if you have an e-commerce site, and uh, you actually want to optimize for leads. If you can get as many leads as possible during that rush, 
as much as possible, then uh, you're, you're going to benefit because so many people are coming in. They may not be ready to buy, but at least maybe you can get them onto your email list and that micro conversion might help you uh, out in the long run. That's a great, that's a great idea for a test to run. Just try to get as many people into your list as possible. Have that, that base that you can communicate with on an ongoing basis. Yeah. Cool. Well, it looks like they shut the lights down on you, but I... I are most uncensored, so I need to start moving around. <laughs> cool. Well, I appreciate your time, and uh, thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Alex. It was great to be here. Thank you for watching the Marketing Optimization Podcast with Alex Designs. Please remember to subscribe to all of the videos in my YouTube channel. Thank you.